Joining me now from ONS Europe 2019 is Azar Saeed, Chief Technologist at Red Hat. Azar, good to see you again on Telecom TV. Why is cloud native becoming increasingly important to telcos? Yeah, telcos are transforming their infrastructure. I mean, most of the applications and network functions that were delivered previously or are being delivered through virtual machines. That's why OpenStack was so much so important. But now services and applications are being disaggregated into microservices and they run in containers. Uh, containers provide a lot of benefit in terms of restart time, portability, um, you know, creating a development platform as well as an integration platform. They're doing CI, CD at the same time. So essentially the whole infrastructure is changing to become more cloud-like, where it's completely abstracted from the hardware infrastructure that's underneath. And that provides them a lot of portability, reusability, efficiency, uh, burstability. These are, these are topics that are really, really important to telcos. And that's why cloud native is really uh, important to them to build that infrastructure. For those telcos now looking to adopt containers, what are the key considerations that they've got to be aware of? Well, uh, so far, in, in the context of containers, while you know containers have been quite prevalent in the IT space, for network functions, um, containers and, net and container network functions are just coming into the market. Part of the reason being, um, Kubernetes has a standard set ways of doing things when it comes to networking and in when it comes to additional functionality where you can supplement that now with Kubernetes actually came up with a very interesting concept called custom resource definition, CRD. And you can supplement functionality through CRD. So that CRD capability is now maturing. Um, operator framework just got, is, is now get, getting some uh, attention and, and uh, you know, uh, momentum. Uh, what it allows you to do is capture operations knowledge. So what really uh, telcos care about is how do you actually deploy these containers at scale? How do you manage them? And what network functions are available today in containers for them to be able to do it? With these advancements in networking, in the operations capability, I think timing is now, or beginning now, where telcos can really look at containers as a technology for their infrastructure. Are container network functions the same as cloud native network functions? That's a great question. Um, anything can be put into a container, even a virtual machine can be put into a container um, and run using a project called Qbert. Um, we refer to it as, uh, you know, container native virtualization, CNB. Um, is that a container that can be orchestrated through Kubernetes? Absolutely. But is that a cloud native function? The answer is no. The reason why it's not a cloud native function is it's not a microservices based function. It's not you know, as stateless as it can be. It has a full application with an operating system. So it has all the baggage that's associated with a virtualized uh, environment. It's not completely disaggregated. It's not leveraging reusability, which is one of the core concepts of uh, cloud functionality. So, no, contain, it can be called as a container network function because it's a repackaged VM, or it could be just an, a monolith application binary that's packaged in a container, but it's not cloud native because it's, it doesn't really conform to the 12-factor app of microservices. For those telcos looking to take the next steps in their transformation journey, how should they prepare for the move? Well, first you have to really work with your partner ecosystem in terms of what is available in containers and how good that uh, particular application or network function is when it, when it comes to conforming to a microservices architecture. So have that conversation with all of your partners. Build a, um, a service in the lab first, end to end, that allows you to experiment with various different components that are cloud native and some that are not. Because we know that it will be a hybrid environment when you start, but hopefully you have a clear migration path to a fully cloud native in the future. So think about networking, don't ignore that. Think about security. 
um, when it comes to containers. It's different when you operate virtual machines versus when you operate containers uh, from a security point of view, from a networking point of view, and from overall operations point of view. So you have to think about all these things. You talk regularly with the major service providers. What progress are you seeing? What we are seeing, I mean, there are some service providers who have made actually uh, good progress in this space. Um, they've begun to exactly experiment and build uh, different types of services by working with their partner ecosystem. I mean, I can give you at least two or three different examples where they call a regular cadence, you know, conversation, meeting, lab work to be able to test a service end to end. And then they have definitive plans of putting that in, in a production environment. There are some service providers who've already taken the leap. They say, oh, for this specific service, I don't need to create a whole end-to-end -end environment. I can containerize this. I can build a microservices model for this. And I can actually go deploy it, whether it is in private cloud or public cloud. So the interest is really high. Um, the movement is really fast. And what I'm seeing more and more people asking me is, can I do my service X or service Y in a cloud native way today? We may not be able to do all of them, but we certainly can make a start. What are some of the pitfalls and challenges that you've seen telcos encounter as they start to adopt containers and containerized network functions? Um, absolutely, there are plenty still. Um, Kubernetes upstream has been uh, you know, very good and moving very, really fast in terms of adopting different functionality. One example that comes to mind is there's a lot of IPv6 ask these days, uh, full dual stack capability. All of that merges into Kubernetes upstream in a couple of releases from now. So it's not there yet fully. Well, you can still do some IPv6. There are ways to work around with respect to IPv6. So that's one example. There are a couple of other examples where you need to expose the hardware functionality for better utilization of hardware and better scheduling of those applications on that hardware type. Because things like you need GPU capabilities, you need smart NIC capabilities, you need FPGA capabilities to accelerate performance. And you have to be able to expose these things via Kubernetes, um, you know, through custom definitions or custom resources uh, in the Kubernetes environment and manage them as such. And so these are some things that are still in the works that are coming. Um, if applications don't require some of these special uh, needs, then certainly they can be containerized today and they can be run. A lot of IT applications run today. Uh, a lot of applications that are very well abstracted from that hardware environment run today, but these will take a little bit more time. How can they learn from the experience of others to avoid these obstacles? Well, careful planning, absolutely. Um, having uh, you know, participation in upstream communities to learn what's going on so that you're not blindsided by what you're expecting to do versus what is available. Um, understanding how you can build a end-to-end -end systems architecture using these components. Uh, you know, have a broader focus. What is the outcome you want to achieve? Uh, how do you want to deliver that service? What is my architectural constraint with respect to that particular service? And can I build an architecture today that evolves me to my you know, ideal um, reference point? And as long as you, you worry about these things, the, then you're probably in, in a safe place and moving in the right direction.